Shalom, good evening. I'm glad to be here again. It's a nice habit to come to talk with you and to listen to you. I'll tell you today about uh, Bruno Schulz, the Jewish Polish writer uh, who was murdered in the time of the Shoah, about how I got to know him, how he has influenced me, and what I learn, keep learning from him again and again whenever I read him. And if in the end of this uh, small lecture you will go tomorrow to a bookstore and ask for the book of Bruno Schulz, then I will feel that I did my job. Once, when he was a boy, on a melancholic evening, his mother, Henrietta, entered his room and she found him feeding grains of sugar to the last house flies to have survived the cold autumn. Bruno, she asked, why are you doing that? And he answered, so they will have strength for the winter. As I said, a Jewish Polish writer who lived in a small town named Drohobich he had a father, his name was Jacob, who was a merchant of carpets, and a mother who helped the father in his job and was the corner store, the cornerstone of the house. Uh, Henrietta Punchek, she was nicknamed, like something like a donut, I think it is. He wrote very few uh, stories. His book, with all the collective stories and uh, a small novella is not thicker than this, but his, wor his work, his stories created a whole world. He described very tiny things. He described a puppy that uh, discovers life, that starts to walk in a very clumsy and fragile way. He writes a story about Taloya, the mad woman of this little town. He writes about his father, and in his stories, his father becomes like a giant, like a prophet from the Bible, but he's not very steady in his mind, this father. And sometimes he, he can turn and become an animal, for example, a little insect that will run on, on the floor and people try to, to hunt him. He writes about a, a, a night of July, of the, mon of the month July, when suddenly, because of the heat, the whole city turns crazy and mad with the, the, the flames of this heat. He created a whole mythology from very small crumbles of reality, from everydayness. He created mythology and he created a whole world that no matter how many times you have read it, each time you, I, discover another point of view, another hint to the nature of mankind, of existence. It seems that everyone who loves Bruno Schulz has his or her own personal story, tale of the moment of discovery. To me it happened when I published uh, my first novel in Hebrew, it's called uh, The Smile of the Lamb. And you know, when there is a new writer in town, it's in Israel but everywhere else, when there is a new writer in town, it's like having a new baby in the family. He comes from nowhere, you don't know really what to make out of this baby. And, and he is a little foreign to you and there is an air of mystery and you want to make him belong and you want to, to make him understandable. You want to decode him. So all the relatives are leaning over the baby's crib and they say, ah, look, he has the, the mouth of Uncle Yankel or he has the nose of Auntie Malka. And so step by step they domesticate the mystery that around him. It is exactly like what happens when there is a new writer in town. Immediately people want to make him belong and decodable and understandable. And so many times 
Uh, I remember at these first years when I published this novel, the critics immediately told me by whom I was influenced, by whom I was inspired, and also from whom I stole. And usually when I went and read after it, mostly for the first time, all those writers who has, have influenced me, inspired me, and from whom I stole, I discovered that yes, did I was influenced, inspired, and maybe even had stolen from them without even knowing them, because somehow the powder of their being was in the air. So one day I got a, a telephone call from a person called Daniel Schillit. He passed away some years ago. He was a Polish Jew. He migrated to Israel in the 70s, I think. And he told me, I've read your book. Young men, I've read your book, he said. Of course you are heavily influenced by Bruno Schulz. Tell you the truth, I never heard the name Bruno Schulz before. I apologize for my ignorance, but it sounded like a compliment, so I didn't argue with him. And I said, Well, yes, maybe, might be. At that very evening, I was at the house of friend, and I told this small anecdote to, to them, and they said, But we do have the book. Have it, read it. So I took the book, and the next day I started to read it, and I was unable to do anything else. I think I read it like a lost letter that I got suddenly from a, a big genius brother or maybe a letter that I found within a bottle on the, on the seaside. A, when I got to the end of the book, totally exhausted by the experience, by the feeling that I was consumed by a huge power that really opened Another dimension of reality to me. You know, there, there are writers and there are writers who suddenly open a whole new dimension. Kafka is someone like that. And Bruno Schulz is uh, someone like that. And Gabriel Garcia Marquez was, in his way, someone like that. Suddenly you feel as if you enter a new magnetic field. And in this magnetic field, new particles of your soul start to fly in the air and start to be attracted to this big magnet. And then, in the epilogue of this book, after all the, the short stories and the longer stories of Bruno Schulz, there was an epilogue that was written by one of the translators of Bruno Schulz to Hebrew, Mr. Joram Brunowski. And therefore, the first time I came, came to hear the story, the anecdote, maybe the legend, of how Schultz has died. And so it was written. In the Drohobich ghetto, Schultz had a protector, protector in quotation marks, in an ironic way, a protector, an SS officer who had exploited and enslaved Schultz to paint murals on the walls of his house. This Nazi officer had an enemy, another Nazi officer, and they had a quarrel about cards or women or ego or whatever. One day, the enemy of this SS officer saw Bruno Schultz, Schultz in Drohobich, on the corner of the streets, Chatsky and Mitzkevich, pulled his gun, shot him dead, and came to the protector the employer, quote unquote, of Bruno Schulz, and told him, I've killed your Jew. Very well, said the Nazi officer. Now I will kill your Jew. Now, the, the many, many admirers of Bruno Schulz, they know, of course, this story. It's a kind of an iconic story. But there are some uh, who believe that although Schulz did die on a specific day on the 19th of November 1942 in the big roundup, the big actia that took place then, but they believe that his death was random. Some years ago, almost 10 years ago, I got a very interesting phone call from an old man in an elderly people's home in uh, Be'er Sheva, a, a city in the south of uh, Israel. His name was Zev Fleischer, and he said, I have a story for you. 
I said, what is the story? He said, come visit me. I came, I visited him. Wonderful human being. He told me he was a pupil of Bruno Schulz in, a gym, in the gymnasium in uh, Drohovich. Schulz taught their uh, drawing. He was also a painter. Uh, but the management of the school put him as the teacher of the most harsh, violent, noisy pupils of all the classes. And he suffered tremendously from them. And the only way for him to save himself when they started making fun of him or throwing all kinds of things at him was to tell them stories. When he started to tell a story, and he, has a magic, he had a magic voice probably, immediately they became silent and they started to listen to him and they were taken by the power of his storytelling. And this old man who was then something like 14 or 15, he was like Schultz, so he said. He was very small, he was not very popular among the boys there. He was very clumsy in his movements. He was very shy, a kind of introvert, like Schultz, and Schultz liked him. And after every lesson, this boy, Ze'ev, would come to Schultz and ask him more questions about what he had taught in the, in the lesson, and they, they, they befriended. Then the second, World War started, then the Shoah, the Holocaust started. Drohobich was occupied by the Nazis. And one day there was this big ground up, big Aktia, and my Ze'ev from Be'er Sheva was separated from his mother and he was desperately trying to find her without being killed by the, the soldiers who walked on the street and just shot every Jew. And he said that when he was crossing the Chatsky and Mitzkevich street, suddenly he saw three people dead lying on the sidewalk. And he said, at that time, you never really paid attention to dead people. Corpses were like, you know, you see a dead cat even today. You don't really ask who he was, what his personality is. So he passed these three people and suddenly he noticed that from the, the coat of one of them, there was a loaf of bread showing. So he decided he will take it because everyone was starving and he wanted to bring it to his mother. And then he came and he turned the dead body and he saw that this was his beloved teacher, Bruno Schultz. And I asked him, did you take the bread? He said, no, 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 how could I? And then he continued to tell me stories about his experience in the Shoah. I came back to Jerusalem at the evening. He called me and he said, listen, I had some terrible hours since you left. I feel that maybe I did not tell you the whole truth. I am not sure that I took, if I took or not, had taken the loaf of bread. I, I asked him, are you sure that you are not sure? He said, yes, I do not know if I take it. I think I might have maybe taken part, a bit of it. And I told him, Zeev, you know, I think that the greatest wish of Bruno Schulz would have been that you would have taken this loaf of bread, exactly as he has fed you in his lessons with such love and generosity. Of course, he would have liked you to take the loaf of bread. The day after, he called and he said, I think I took the, the bread to my mother. <laughs> yeah. So this is one story. So I must say, just for the record, that I heard two other testimonies who said that Schulz was murdered deliberately by, by this uh, SS officer. We don't know. But what I told you about the story of the two rivals, the two Nazi officers, and this awful expression, I killed your Jew, now I'll kill your Jew, as if a person is, is a, you know, a chair that you can replace with another one as if humans have no soul, no uniqueness. This is very, very famous anecdote and I always remember the, the words of the Argentinian writer Ernesto Sabato who said that anecdotes are essentially faithful to the truth precisely because, because they are fictional 
because they are invented detail by detail until they fit a certain person exactly. So, even if the story about the Gestapo officers is, the SS officer is fiction, it touches us deeply because the tale is still faithful in its essence to the truth, to a certain tragic and even ironic truth about the man Bruno Schulz and to his own sense of existential feeling of unworthiness and of insignificance. I remember that after I have read these words, I killed your Jew very well, I will, I closed the book and I left my home and I walked around in circles in, in a little place overlooking the desert of Judea. And I walked for some hours, I think. I lost count of the hours. I felt I'm walking like in a fog. And I just couldn't bring myself to go back home. I didn't understand how it was possible to continue to live in a world that such events can happen, that such people can exist, that such monstricities, ver verbal linguistic monstricities as this sentence, I killed your Jew, now I'll kill your Jew. How, how can I live in a reality that allows things like that? A world in which even the fabrication and the negation of such sentence sounds reasonable. And along with those feelings of paralysis, I felt awakening in me a need to redeem the life and the death of Bruno Schulz, to redeem the vitality that has been in him, in Bruno Schulz and in his words and in his stories. I wanted to redeem them, to take them out of the clothes of cruelty and of indifference, the tyranny in which Schulz had to spend his la last years under the Nazi regime, to redeem them from the concision of the Nazi syntax that allowed this terrible phrase to be said. I also knew that I was looking for a way to write about the Shoah. Ever since I became a writer, ever since I was a child, I think, I felt I must write something about the Shoah that has tormented me as a child. And I was born nine years after the end of the Shoah. And it, my parents were not even survivors, but I felt that I, I must put myself there if I want to understand life here. I knew that I will never be able to understand my life as a writer, as a father, as a man, as a Jew, as an Israeli, unless I lived my unlived life, my unlived life there in the dimension of the, of the Shoah, in the space of the Shoah. I wanted to find out what is there inside me, the thing that I could have put in front of total obliteration of the uniqueness of myself as a human being had I been there, had I been sent there to this terrible place. And when I, re when I finished reading Bruno Schulz, I felt that he, has, he had given me this key. The key to writing about the Shoah not to writing about death and annihilation, but writing about life, about what the Nazis had destroyed in a massive and mechanized way. I wanted to write about life as Bruno Schulz taught me, life that is alive, life that is continuous revival of people that I have met, of moments past, of sights that I have seen thousands of times, 
of a word that I have spoken or written thousands of times before, he has the ability to revitalize all these. Every one of Schulz's lines is a rebuke to the world in which, as he put it, all meaningful things are walled up, all meaningful things are surrounded by a wall, a protest against tedium, against banality, against routine, against the stereotyping of human being, against the tyranny of the fears that paralyzes us, against the shrunken, the simplistic, against whatever lacks daring and is devoid of inspiration and nobility, against whatever has no soul. In his story that is called Taylor's Dummies, Schultz describes uh, his father and he says, in contact with this strange man, all things reverted to the roots of their existence, rebuilt their outward appearance anew from their metaphysical core, returned to the primary idea in order to betray it at some point and to turn into doubtful, risky, and equivocal regions, which we shall call for short, the regions of the great heresy. There is no more precise description than this to the writing of Bruno Schulz himself, of his incessant search for the metaphysical core of things, of everything, but also of his capacity to change his point of view instantly and to turn at the very last second in the most ironic and ambiguous way to the regions of great heresy. This is the strength of this great writer who has no illusions about the nature of world. Bruno Schulz has no illusion about the arbitrary, chaotic, random nature of life, yet is nonetheless determined to force life, to force existence itself, the indifferent existence, to force it to surrender, to open itself wide and expose the kernel of meaning hidden in its depths. And although Schultz is a big believer in some significance or meaning, that generates and regulates everything in the world, people, animal, plants, objects. To all of them he grants, with a smile, he grants vitality and soul and desire, but still he is able in an instant to uproot himself from this faith and deny it absolutely with a sort of demonic despair which only intensifies our sense of his profound loneliness and our intuition that this man has no consolation in the world. In my book, Vedi al voce amore, Bruno Schulz appears as a fictional character and under the cover of this fictional character, I smuggled him under the nose of the literary critics and the historians, and against reality, I took him to, Dro to from Drohobich, his hometown, during the war, to Gdansk, Danzig, to the pier near the sea in Gdansk, where he jumped into the water and joined a school of salmon fish. Now, why salmon? Indeed, why salmon? Perhaps because Salmon always, for me, seemed to be a living incarnation of a journey. You all know, I think, the story, the life story and the life cycle of, of Salmon. They are being born in one of the rivers in the north of sweet water rivers. And after they, they hatch, they start to go down the river and they get to the sea and suddenly they are able to swim in salt water, which is quite rare, this change of mechanism. And they swim in the sea with huge schools of millions and millions. And then one day, 
they get a kind of a pulse in their brain and all the huge school turns back and start to swim back to the very point where they were born. And they swim, as you know, they swim against predators, hawks, and bears, and fishermen. And they jump against waterfalls of 10 and 15 meters, and they manage to overcome them. Until very few of them, those who survive this tormenting journey, they get to the exact, exact spot where they were spawned, and they lay their eggs there. And when the baby salmon hatch, they swim upon the dead bodies of their parents. Only a few, very few, survive to perform the journey for the second time. And maybe they are the leader of this huge new school of salmon. When I first read the description of the life cycle of the salmon, I thought that there is something very, very Jewish about them. Uh, this inner sing signal that they get, and suddenly it forces you almost to go back to the place where you were born, the place where you got your identity, uh, against all difficulties and all obstacles to go back there. And by the way, there might be also something very Jewish in the drive to immediately leave this homeland and go again into, into uh, the world. Uh, but there was something else that drove me to choose Salmon. Something deeply connected with the writing of Bruno Schulz. Because reading Schultz made me realize that usually in our day-to-day -day life, we feel our life mainly when they are, when, when, when it is running off of us, when we are draining of life or vitality, when we age, when we lose some of our physical, bodily abilities, and of course, needless to say, when we lose dear friends or people who are very precious to us. And then at such moment we pause for a minute, for a second, we sink into ourselves and we know there was something here and now, now it is gone. It will not come back and we will never again be as we used to be before we lost it. And we may recognize then in a second, in a sudden, in a very poignant way, that we understand what we have lost truly and deeply only when it's gone. And when one reads Bruno Schultz page by page, one suddenly senses the words returning to their sources, to the strongest and most authentic pulse of life within them. Suddenly, we want more. This is the effect that we have when, that I have when I read Bruno Schulz. Suddenly, we know that it's possible, that it is legitimate to want more, that life is greater, greater than everything that deteriorates, that is dimming down, that is narrowing us, that steadily is fading away from us. And when I wrote the Bruno chapter in Vedi al Voce Amore and described an imaginary scenario in which Bruno Schulz flees the failure of civilization and the failure of language of humans, he joins a school of Salmon. And I felt that I was very close to touching the root of life itself, the primal naked impulse of life which Salmon seemed to sketch in their journey over the waves, and which the real Bruno Schulz wrote about in his books, and for which he yearned in every one of his stories, the longed-for realm that he called in one of his most famous story, the age of genius. For Bruno Schulz, the age of genius was an age driven by the faith 
that life could be created over and over and over again through the power of imagination, through passion and through love. The faith, the belief, the despair had not yet overruled any of these forces and that we had not yet been eaten away by our own cynicism and nihilism. The age of genius was, for Bruno Schulz, a period, in, a period of perfect childhood, feral, filled with light, with passion, with love, which even if it lasted for only a brief moment in the life of the individual, of human being, he would miss it to the rest of his life and would look for it in every possible direction and dimension. Did the age of genius really occur, asks Bruno Schulz in this book, and we, the readers, we ask together with him, was there ever really an age of sublime inspiration when men could return to childhood, when mankind could return to its childhood? An age when a primeval river of life, of vitality, of creativity, gloriously raged, an age where, when essences had not frozen into forms, when everything was still possible and flexible and plentiful and childlike? Did the age of genius ever occur, Schultz wonders, and if it did, would we recognize it, answer its secret call to us? Would we dare to relinquish the elaborate defense mechanism that we always build around ourselves until it paralyzes us and become our prison? A few years after Bruder Schulz wrote these lines, these wishes for a genius age, for a primeval flow of creativity, came another age, an age that was the utter opposite, the age of, of beastly murder, of massive, faceless destruction. And yet, to that terrifying call, many, many responded with depressing, enthusiasm and eagerness. In Vedia Voce Amore, I tried to bring to life, even only for a few pages, a feeble echo of the age of genius, as Schultz has suggested in his writing. I wrote about an age in which every person is a creator, an artist, and each human life is unique and treasured, an age in which we adults feel unbearable pain over our fossilized childhoods and a sudden urge to dis dissolve the crust that has congealed around us. An age in which everyone understands that killing a human being destroys a singular work of art which can never be replicated, recreated again an age in which it is no longer possible to produce or even to imagine such sentences as, I kill your Jew, now I'll go and kill your Jew. Stalin once said, a death, or one death, a death of one is a tragedy, but million deaths, it's statistic. When I read the stories of Bruno Schulz, I can feel in them and in myself the ceaseless pounding of an impulse to defy that statement of Stalin, an impulse to rescue the life of the individual, his only precious, tragic life from that statistic. Even the word Holocaust, Shoah in Hebrew, has become for many people no more than a hollow concept a symbol, just a symbol, of dreadful events. Contact with those events has become abstract to many, many of us, sterilized of pain and drained of meaning. This is also why I was driven to write Vedi alla voce amore. I have always hoped that the people who read this book will feel and understand that the millions who were murdered in the Shoah six million Jews 
and the many, many millions of others who lost their life in the Second World War, that each and every one of them, men, woman, child, was an age of genius of itself, a unique and idiosyncratic wor a work of art that will never, ever be restored. In recent years, I've been going back more or less once a year, like a periodical medication, to read the stories of Bruno Schulz. For me, it's a sort of annual tune-up, strengthening the, the antibodies against the temptations of apathy and cynicism. Every time I open his book, I am amazed and you to discover how this writer, a single human being, who very rarely left his hometown of Drohobich, how he managed to create for us an entire world, an alternative dimension of reality, and how he continues even now, so many years after his death, to feed us grains of sugar so that we may somehow make it through the long and endless winter. Thank you for your listening. And if you have any question, I will happily answer. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm sorry for my terrible English, but I will try to ask you something. Um, talking about globalization, um, I feel like writers nowadays, like young writers, like we, we would like to be, are losing one step of the travel of salmons, because I feel like there's no more a community in which we have to go back. Like, we are pushed to start the travel, like, out from our region, our nation. Like, I feel like many writers are now trying to write like American writers, even if they're Europeans. And maybe there's a lack of community that doesn't permit other people to, like European people, to go to the US maybe and then go back to Europe and refine what they, what they were, where they were born. And maybe in, like Israel is a particular place because it's a nation but it's also a community. Like the sense of community is stronger there. So what, what do you think? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, you know, when you try to write, not you yourself, when, when young writers today try to write like writers in America write, uh, you can be sure that it will not interest anyone, not in your own place and not in America. In America, they have the original. They don't need any duplicates of that. And uh, in your own place, it will look fake and hollow. Uh, I think part of being a writer is to be able to recognize the wonders and the miracles of your everydayness and to understand that they are unique. Nobody grew up in a house like yours. Uh, you know, they, they are, it, it reminds me, I, I'll, I'll tell you two short anecdotes. When, when my brother and I, when we were children, we felt that our life are so boring and banal, so we decided to call each other John and Harry. It gave us an air of being, you know, international. Now, it was in the time when Israel, the, the new state of Israel, was in the focus of the attention of the whole world. People came and made movies 
about children like us. People wrote books about this newborn after the Shoah. There was an air really of, of miracle around everything. It was the language, as, as the humorist Kishon said, that the mothers were learning the mother tongue from, from their children because the parents came from the diaspora, but the children were born in Israel. We were the first generation of Israeli born and Israel so, uh, sovereignty. It was really something magic, but we totally did not understand it. You know, we, we thought that real life happened in places where children are called John and Harry. So this is the, the first. The second is a story that I tell almost every time I, 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 talk, to, I talk on stage. And this is a story about my dear sweet father, who now turned 90. And uh, when I was writing Il Libro della Grammatica Interiore, it's a book about a small family in Jerusalem. Small, very banal, with all the relationship in the family and all the nuance and, and, and the drama grows and grows and grows because there is nothing more, I think, the, the greatest drama of humanity is the, is, is the drama of the family. No other dramas can match the drama of a family. And each and every one of us has a family. Sometimes unfortunately, but I think also fortunately. When I finished writing the book, Il Libro della Grammatica Interiore, I thought it's only fair that I will give it to my parents to read because in a way it describes a family that, is, that resembles them. And my father read this, the book. And he said, well, David, it's very nice story, but do you think someone out of our family will be able to understand it? And I thought it's a wonderful question. And I, I, I thought this is how I want to write my books, that my father will ask, do you think that anyone out of our family can understand it? That it will be written in the grammatica interiore of, of our family. And I learned over the years, and, and I, I'm writing now for 35 or 40 years maybe, that the more I drill in my own backyard, the more I write about the things that I understand their DNA from within, the more I'm protected from the temptation to write about other realities that might look very sensational and attractive to me. The more I am within my own codes, these are the stories I, I want to write. And you mentioned twice the word community. You know, this is something that everyone can, can answer for himself or herself if they have a community. And of course we need a community because we are social creatures and we are built out of connections with others and, and even the personalities within us are reflections of, of other people, even if we do not no recognize it, even if we do not want to admit it, to what extent we are made of people who are close to us, and sometimes there are people who, whom we do not like very much. I feel that the, the most essential, I mean, I'll say it simply, the writer is his or her own community. Uh, that's it. Other questions? Thank you very much for a really wonderful lecture. Thank you. Um, listening to you talk about Bruno Schulz and terrible deaths and meaningless deaths and terrible sentences, I can't help but wonder about the fact that um, we are living in a world today where politicians and people in power can brazenly say the most terrible things without any consequences, in fact, winning. <laughs> Um, so, uh, listening to you talk about Schultz, it seems to me that he found a different way to, found, to fight against these terrible things, which was just to write beautiful sentences. So my question is, do you believe that the way to rebel against these terrible things that are being said in the world today by people in power is to write beautiful sentences and redeem the lives of the dead instead of engaging with them in some sort of conflict? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a complicated question. You, you are absolutely right in the sense that it seems more and more that words are without any meaning. You know, that someone like uh, Donald Trump can say whatever he wants 
And everybody knows that it's not the truth. Yes, we are talking now that lots of talks that you probably heard about the post-truth era. We are in the post-truth era. You can say everything and you can contradict yourself tomorrow and you say, no, I was just joking, I didn't mean that. Uh, and it creates a world that really it's very hard to ground yourself to. You, you feel you are floating because you are deprived of the anchors that held you connected to life, to truth, to some values that you adhere to. Uh, in that sense, I think, I will not talk only about Bruno Schulz because I spoke a lot about him here, but writers have a duty here. You know, usually I say that the, the only duty of a writer is to tell a good story. All the other duties are kind of byproducts. You have to tell a good story. Don't try to write a story with certain values. Don't try to give a political uh, platform to a party. Don't, don't like to be too psychological. Write a good story. If you really write a good story, if you touch truth, then all the others will emerge inevitably. But since we deal with words, and words are being emptied from their meaning in, in this period, it is important for writers to be able, by the way they write, to bring us back to the roots, to the authentic roots of words, of formulations, to ground us back in the meaning of, of the words that we use. To you, we, we are obliged now, and many of you, maybe all of you, are writers or writers to be, we are obliged to create in our stories, to create the feeling that the language is reliable, the language that we choose is reliable, that we stand behind every word that we say, that we are not just tempted by certain words because they are beautiful. Beautiful words we had enough. We have to have really truthful, solid words that you feel that there is content of trust within every word and every phrase that, that we put. This is maybe the, the, the best thing that we can do in, in a world that goes, in a way it goes crazy. In a way, we are now in a very, really today is the 19th, tomorrow is the 20th when the new elect president of the United States will enter his office. It's a very strange situation that the whole world is waiting to hear what one person, one out of eight billion people, million uh, billion people in the world, what he thinks, what he plans, what his ideals are. I'm not sure he himself knows it. Yes, I'm really, because his second name is unpredictable. And I believe he's unpredictable even to himself. So especially in a world that will be stormed, kidnapped by this easygoingness of using words and declining them and denying them and turning your back on them and suddenly saying other words that no one, no one expected from you to hear. In such a world, really the place of people who will insist on the authentic, on the authenticity of words, it's, it's enormous. Our role today is enormous. Um, you know, I, I come from Israel, as, as you know. And I live in a reality that after 50 years of occupation that we occupy the Palestinians, and after 110 or 20 years of conflict, we know now that the first thing that is being forged manipulated, confiscated, is the language. The first thing that the government and the army and the police and our fears and our stereotypes that they confiscate and they change and manipulate is the language. There is a special language created in order that we shall not really know what is the reality. A special language is created so there will be a buffer between the individual, the citizen, who most of the time is a normal and even 
polite, tender human being between him and the brutal reality of the conflict and of the occupation. All the time there is a new dictionary like George Orwell wrote in uh, 1948 in his book. Uh, and over the years people get used to this. I'll tell you that today even the people in the left in Israel will not say the occupation, the Israeli occupation, the settlers will not talk about the Israeli occupation, they say the, allegedly the occupation. They already started to unearth the fact that it is an occupation and they call it, no, it's something like it's, you know, it's not the real thing. By the way, another word that is not being mentioned today in Israeli public sphere, what is the word? Shalom, peace. This word is not being used. If you use the word shalom, as I try to do whenever I write or talk, I'm regarded either as a dreamer or worse, as a traitor, because I try to convince the Israelis that there is a chance to have peace sometimes, I, and by so doing, I weaken their strong position that they need to have as warriors, as, as people who are at war. So you see how there is a vicious circle of people who do not want to hear the word peace. They become more and more firm and tough and entrenched like a fist in order to be a better warriors, because there is war all over. And this situation perpetuates itself as if they doom themselves to live in a climate that the word, the word peace is impossible, non-existent. And they doom themselves to fight. And if you come to tell them that there is another alternative, they, they hate you sometimes. All of that comes to say we have now especially in this era, we have responsibility. More questions. Good evening. Um, I'm translating a question from this lady beside me. And she wanted to know if there was any figure like Bruno Schultz that was a good inspiration for your book, uh, Be My Knife. Thanks. Interesting. No, actually, <laughs> that, that's a, a very interesting question. I never thought of it, but uh, Schultz himself, he had very complicated and even today we might call them distorted relationship with women. Uh, like Kafka, by the way, he, he translated Kafka to Polish, but like Kafka, he always, he wanted the woman and then he was rejected from her and was taken aback and rarely met this woman. You know, he corresponded with uh, Felica Bauer and then with Milena for years and years and hardly saw them. Uh, and uh, in Ketusia uh, Permeid Coltello, it is, uh, it is a story about a man who sees a woman, Yair, his name is Yair, her name is Miriam. He sees her in a reunion party at school. She's a teacher and he falls in love for her. And he starts, he asks her for her permission to write her stories. And he writes her more, sorry, letters, not stories. He writes her more and more and more letters, but he, he is afraid of actually meeting her. Because he said, with you, I don't want a story of betraying my wife, betraying my wife. With you, I don't want, as it said in Hebrew, a story on the side. With you, I want a story a real story to, to happen between us, as if we have a common child, this story. And she responds to him and she answers, and in the end she makes him meet her, yes. Uh, and I really try to see to what extent we can build relationship based on words only. Uh, and you can say that partly Bruno Schulz had this, this tendency in his personality, but I, until you ask, I didn't think about it this way. I just want to tell you that the other day I was, I, was, I come from Germany, I was in Stuttgart, and uh, uh, after a lecture, uh, a woman, young Italian woman from Udine came to me with a Ketusia per male coltello, and she tells me, I must tell you a story. I was the knife for a man, and now I'm his wife. So be my wife, yes. <laughs> Other questions? Going back to the metaphor of the Solomons, yeah. 
At a certain point in their life, they feel an unstoppable urge to go back to the place where they belong, to their house, to their home. So what happens to a man who feels this urge and goes back home, but in a fastly changing world, like today's, doesn't find it like that, finds it changed. And the second part of the, qu of the question is, if home cannot be a physical place because of, because of changes in today's world, can home uh, be an idea? Can home be a place in the spirit and not in the real world? Can it not be a physical place but a mental one? Yeah, first of all, to your first question, yes, I think in, as you describe it, in our chaotic world, you, you want to come home and there is no home, or home is so different that you stop recognizing it and uh, sometimes even without leaving your home, the home changes so much around you. And again, I will testify from my experience. I live in Israel and this place is, is a home for me and yet it's being changed dramatically and sometimes violently and quite often against what I wish to see as a home. Uh, and, and yet I stay because I believe that if I stay, maybe I can contribute, you know, one millimeter that this process will be delayed a little. Uh, and the home, you say very beautifully, can be an idea. For me, it can be a language. I feel very much that the Hebrew language is my home. It's the only language that I really understand and I understand different layers of it and I studied the Bible for many, many years. I, I'm an atheist, non-believer at all, but I studied the Bible because there are the, the residues of all our psychology, history, mentality as a people in the Bible. And when I read the Bible, I understand more Israel of today, even if there is a gap of 4,000 years between the events described in the Bible and our news, uh, morning newspaper. Uh, so language can be a real home. Uh, and uh, again, the, the term home is so important and meaningful for me because for most history, one of the basic definition of a Jew in my eye is someone who never really felt at home in the world. We never really felt at home in the world. Even when we thought we felt there was an air of uncertainty and a feeling that the earth might tremble and shake under our feet at any given moment. And so many moments like that has, have occurred. Uh, even here in, in Italy, during the, the Second World War, the earth was shaken under our feet. Uh, and Israel, the state of Israel was created so that we shall have a home, that there will be a place that we shall belong to, that we shall know where the, the, the borders of it are, that it will not shake all the time, that we shall be able to see our future there, that we shall see sequence of generation of children and grand grandchildren and part of my sadness regarding the situation is that in spite of the fact that we have created a lot of small and big miracles in israel and we overcame so many difficulties and wars and economic ter terrible economic situation and having to absorb waves and waves of immigration to israel and to integrate them into Israel. We did create great, huge things, but still it's not the home in the way I wish Israel to be a home in, a, you know, the place that you feel comfortable in, that you, you are not afraid, you are not under any existential threat. Maybe this is something too far to ask in the Middle East with all its brutality that we see around us in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Libya. But I still believe that it is possible. And I still believe that the only way for us Israelis and Palestinians to achieve normal life, decent life, life of simple dignity, that you know that you will not be humiliated at your home and on the street near to your home. It's only through having peace between us and them. And I know less and less people in my region believe in this option, but I, you know, I believe that sometimes 
against all odds and against reality, you have to stick to an idea just to formulate the alternative. To remind people that there is another way, that we are not doomed to live by the sword and to die by the sword. And this act of insisting on the alternative is also part of the responsible that I spoke some moments ago of our era. Ragazzi, thank you very much. You were very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.